to uh, work with Twitter. Um, I'll have questions being popped up here uh, with the panel as well. Um, so I should get to my introductions now. Now, to my left, Christine. Lovely to, lovely to see you. Christine is the CEO and Managing Director of Blackmores, appointed in uh, 2008. She held senior management positions in Asia, the Americas, and Australia, working to deliver growth and expansion into Asia, Christine. Uh, she's also the chair of the Australia ASEAN Council and serves on the board of the Collingwood Football Club, for which I forgive her. Uh, <laughs> Christine was named CEO of the year by CEO Magazine and the CEO Institute and the highest performing CEO in Australia by the Daily Telegraph, which is quite a wrap. Uh, and she's had an extraordinary ride at, at Blackmore's Will, where she's had a full experience of rewards and risks, which, which I'm sure we'll come to. Now, to her left, Tsuyoshi Kawashima is CEO of NTT Communications. ICT solutions responsible for the development of, of operations, sales and marketing for business in Australia. Uh, since joining, Tsuyoshi has held a number of management roles within the company as a member of the board of the Phil Philippine Long Distance Telephone Company, which is the largest telco in the Philippines, and also served as President and CEO of NTT Communications in Thailand. And to my far right, we've got Bill Evans, who is of course the highly, many of you know Bill, but the highly respected Chief Economist at uh, Westpac, a great time to be an economist, uh, responsible for all the bank's economic research. And uh, he joined Westpac all the way back in 1991, I think, as chief economist back then. So welcome, Bill. And uh, Westpac obviously the sponsors. And finally, David Landers, to my immediate right, uh, was appointed general manager of international operations, growth and emerging markets for Austrade. Uh, that was back in 2011. Uh, now, Austrade, I'm sure many of you know this, but assists companies uh, in, in uh, working uh, to grow their international business and attracts foreign, foreign investment into Australia and also help the education sector. Now, David has lived and worked across most continents with a lot of time in China, Indonesia, and India. He's founded uh, uh, an emerging technology fund and he was CFO of Asia Foods Limited. She co-founded in Shanghai, and he was also uh, M&A and strategy head for Pepsi Cola. So, welcome to our panel. Now, perhaps I can kick off with Christine because you have just had your results just come through yesterday. Now, it's been a huge um, sort of experience for you, right at the coalface of engaging with China. Can you give us a bit of a feel for what that horse has done, the highs and the lows? Because you've had quite a tough half. We've, we've had a tough half, but um, Rick, can I just acknowledge someone in the audience as an um, old colleague of David in the audience called Peter Osborne. He's an ex-Austrade person that I value Austrade so much in their support. I hired that guy and made him managing director of Asia. So we've been in a bit of a trip, joint venture, me and Peter together to do this Asia thing. Um, I just need to give them a plug because I like them to get recognition. Terrific. <laughs> but look, if I step back and think about our journey in Asia, we've been in Asia for 40 years as a company. And in my own time in Blackwells in the last eight years, we've had some great highs and we've had some challenging times as well, I'm the first to tell you. And particularly in China, just as we launched in there nearly five years ago, literally <coughs> weeks later, just as we'd hired a team of 50 people, they changed the regulation and closed the borders to all health foods coming in. No, this is what I was trying to bring so, up with Maggie. Uh, Joe, you know. it, it, it has, you know, the, there's been challenging times and good times, but I'm a huge believer in the prospects of China for Australia. And how, people, how, how do you pull back now, looking at the Chinese entrepreneurs in, in Australia, it's not just you, obviously, but, uh, but Bellamy's um, actually was impacted more. Um, how do you balance the Chinese entrepreneur here in Australia with direct engagement through, perhaps through Alibaba, through your own channels? We do have our own, look, we work very closely with Maggie and we've got the highest regard for her. We do have our own channels as well. We have people, we believe it's important to actually build a presence in the retail market, not just e-commerce. E-commerce is an important part. But, you know, here in Australia, we have benefited also from the Daigos coming and shopping and, 
And it's actually different to e-commerce. They take it back and, and sell it to family and friends. But really, all of those things are evidencing the strong demand for brand. You know, people look at my results today, though, and a lot of the media said, oh, it's all down because of China. Actually, it is down from an amazing year last year. It's still 50% up from the year before, yeah. and 100% up from the year before that. Well, the, the, the market so, clearly came <laughs> down 10% the shares yesterday, but, but you're, you're uh, going forward. The second half looks more promising. Well, I know, I know I don't want to be overconfident about the Australian economy because I read the newspapers every day and most people have got mixed feelings at the moment. But I'm very confident about the value that Asia can bring to Australian businesses. But I would say it's complex, it does evolve, and it's not for the faint-hearted. So you have to have a very clear strategy and you have to you know, hold on. David, can I bring you in here? Uh, what do you think of uh, how the engagement with uh, China first, but also the rest of the Asia, uh, the rest of Asia is going in terms of businesses trying to get to those markets? Well, um, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that it's it's going uh, extremely well. Um, if you look across uh, any any category, food, uh, consumer products, um, and services, uh, we're looking at uh, double-digit growth rates, high double-digit growth rates um, across all categories. Um, I would say in the last couple of years, uh, services have really started to kick in. So within ASEAN, we've seen uh, over the last three years about a 12% uh, percent growth in what I would call a modern services. And, and that is on top of traditional services, which we're all uh, familiar with, which we've seen a lot of media about, which includes uh, both uh, tourism services and education services that, that we're selling. So right across both Great China and Southeast Asia, uh, there is uh, plenty of evidence. Um, I could take you through a list, uh, which my team is prepared for me here, which would take you across every single category of food, consumer products, um, and they would mirror double-digit growth rates uh, akin to uh, what we've but heard if, about. But if, if you've got a small business in, say, some yeah. sort of services, does it vary country by country as to whether you should try and go out there, physically start, or do perhaps go through uh, the e-commerce route? Uh, less risk, perhaps, or does that vary depending on what you It does vary. What I was getting on to there is um, the work that the government has done in many areas, the free trade agreements, for example. That's creating the preconditions necessary for Australian, to be, Australian companies to be successful. But, that's opening the door. Business still has to open, go through the door, has been opened, and there is still very much an execution uh, challenge associated with that. Um, unique to the China market, there is almost no market in the world where you, there is no market in the world where you're going to find 700 million people who are uh, connected um, through every moment of their waking day. Uh, via an internet connected mobile device. Uh, that's a very unique, that's something that uh, we identified several years ago, uh, could become a new channel that could democratize um, the access to the China market for Australian business. And we pushed very hard to develop that up as a capability within Australia to enable Australian business. Um, so, but that channel uh, <clears throat> is not a channel that you can find uh, as matured in, in other Asian markets. Um, so in those markets, um, it's still a matter of, of, for Austria, providing on the ground client services, um, making sure that we have made all best efforts to put in place the preconditions, free trade agreements, uh, technology landing pads for startup companies. Um, can, can I bring in a question that's from the floor here? 62% of Alibaba's consumers are under 29. How best can Australian business get to know what these <coughs> customers' needs are? I, I think that um, we have a panelist who's in the perfect position to, to answer that Absolutely, question. Well. But, you know, so it's, the question is essentially a user requirements question. So, you know, who is your user? What do they need and want? And uh, so, in, in the case of uh, working with Alibaba, if they are anything, uh, they're a data analytics company. Um, they have a substantial amount of data 
Uh, and uh, but you have to be good at execution. You have to know how to to work with them to uh, you know to get access to that data, to interpret that data, and then use that data to understand who your users are, what their requirements are, and to uh, refine and align your product with that. One of the great things that Alibaba and the other major e-commerce platforms will do for you is they have a very good feel, a very good understanding for what the, the user requirements are in a very highly segmented way. And so they're filtering who they put through other platforms and who they spend their, who they allocate their resources to based on their understanding of requirements. Christine, do you want to take a moment? Well, I think in Australia we're incredibly fortunate. There are 4 million Asian people living in Australia. We have an incredible diaspora, and we have an incredible youth of students. So you don't actually have to look too far to find this rich part of our population you can just go and talk to. And I'm particularly keen on helping the students that come in from China and ASEAN and helping those support small businesses, because many small businesses really love the idea of what Maggie was talking about, but they get afraid about what they don't know in their language. So if they just actually tap into Sydney University, it's got something like 50,000 Asian students. We've got this really rich part of our population that can help. Mm. So Yoshi, can I bring you in here, sir, because um, from a Japanese point of view and NTT Communications, clearly there's been uh, a lot of investment in Japan some years ago. And I can remember at the time there was people in Australia worried about what this investment would do. Uh, what is your experience now? Because we think of Japanese investment as being very successful in, in Australia. Uh, yes, it's a, uh, how can I say, it's a joke. Firstly, to the, uh, I want to cover the our history, NDT history. Is that the reason it is you know, quite new to be go abroad? Because you, Australia yeah. was, uh, was your first choice. Ah, Australia. yes, is that the post, is that the, uh, even though we have, let uh, say, to the 140 or the 150 history, but uh, I should say to the, just only to the uh, global business experience, and just uh, 20 to 30 years, and then to the point to the enter the global market, is that the first choice is uh, to the US and uh, to the Europe and Australia. How important is the Australia? Also, though we are the best in the Japan to expand to the Asian market, but uh, geographically, geography is a very important idea to the to country here. Is to the to connect to our from the to Japan to the to our US is to the high bandwidth. But uh, definitely, we need to the to our the diversification to the to the to Australia to the to our uh, US. It's a geographical reason and also the to the you know. Here, either you have the, to the everybody say either to the very capable the, to the people. So it is a why not we have to jump into the to the Australia first. Yeah. Now you you are in um, in business with both uh, Alibaba, with Amazon, with everybody. Are you uh, pretty neutral on on who you uh, deal yes, with? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a the good question for me. The, uh, because the, uh, we are the best the infrastructure provider. Say to the we uh, to support this company, we support this company is very difficult to say either to the you know the to the Honda, Toyota, or the to Ford. And we should say to the to smile, smile, smile. Is it to the is it to the point that to the something happen is because they are very basic the infrastructure. And so people people have been, I suppose, uh, unconvinced about. How fast Australia, I'm going to bring Bill in a minute on this too, how fast Australia has been transitioning from you know, our mining boom into the, the services side and indeed tourism. But you see that, you, you, you have confidence in Australia that that will build up considerably. Yeah, definitely yes. yes. To the, to the, I have the, to the, to the, to the, to several the rational reason. Is it to the here? Is it to the to our remedy to the first tourist the area? And then once the to the to our have the to expand here, is it to the to our the expand the such a uh, expand the to from here to the to the overseas? Is it to the um? Is it to the can I can I say that my personal experience? Is it that, you know the I'm here to get married in Saudi Arabia. Is it that I can be to the honeymoon? Is it to Gold Coast and the Sydney? And so you like, you like uh, yeah, yeah, 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, the, uh, I, of course, we went to the to our opera house and also the city to the uh, harbor, the bridge, 
Uh, what, uh, what about yeah. the quality of the hotels? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Is a, the, is a bad, yeah, the, yeah, this one is also the part of the ferry in the Eastern Point. And the, to, the, to Japan, they do the company to the invest, and now they do somebody to the uh, have a bridge in the area to the uh, to or uh, the, to ownership the, to transfer to the, from the Japan to the, to China or Korea. Is to the but uh, it means to the, to convince the, to the uh, you have the very nice the uh, government and then to the to or uh, make it to free trade is a form of the to the. To Okay. Uh, yeah, the here. All right, Bill. Let me let me bring you in because um, talking about the transition in the economy, what are the factors that the, the key factors that that Asia is sort of influencing the Chinese economy? I guess uh, we've got this transition happening, but property must also be a very big issue. Uh, sure, Tiki. Yes. Look, if we think about how China is affecting Australia. Uh, there's probably three major channels at the moment. The first one, of course, is property. Um, it's amazing how the lucky country has been able to transform from a mining boom to a construction boom. We currently have 110,000 apartments under construction, and a lot of that has been due to substantial demand, either from Asian residents in Australia or Asians, um, and particular Chinese, offshore. The second uh, uh, boom that we've had is in, uh, as we've talked about, is tourism and, and education. Uh, China's role there has been, it's not the largest education or the largest tourist source at this stage, but it's by far the fastest growing. In fact, tourism is up about uh, uh, three, a factor of three over the last few years. And what about the quality of our hotels here? Because somebody said, in one of our briefing calls that uh, we're a bit down on that if we really want to be a top player tourist-wise. Yes, well, we've, we've been a bit surprised that we haven't seen more, um, uh, more, more capacity in the hotel market, but clearly if that can be seen to be sustained, then uh, that's something that uh, will come. The final way in which they affect us, of course, is through um, our, our wealth, which is the value of the commodities that we export. And China's role this year has been absolutely critical in terms of boosting the iron ore price to $100. We didn't think it would ever get to that again, having come from about $35. Um, and so there's a, a, these are the, the complex ways in which China affects Australia. But you wouldn't expect an economist not to tell you about the dark clouds that are there, and there are quite a few. I've been in the US for the last three weeks talking to investors, talking to policy makers, talking to businesses uh, and the risks around Trump's, uh, Trump's policies that may well affect China are substantial. Um, he has to be able to find a way to finance his corporate tax cuts and uh, one way to do that would be to introduce a border adjustment tax which would mean that companies that sold goods in the US would not get a tax deduction for goods that they purchased in China now, or offshore. Yes. Um, that, of course, would uh, have major implications for China's exports. If he doesn't take that route, he may indeed just uh, choose to put large tariffs on China. And, of course, if that was to happen, then uh, China's trade position, which is currently a surplus of about 5% on goods and a deficit of about 2.5% on the services that we love selling to them, China might have to reassess uh, those services, um, uh, that leakage from services. So. Uh, that do, you is think another... going, do you think it's really going to happen? I mean, we've just had the uh, Canadian trade delegation through, and I spoke to the trade minister. He actually didn't think the whole the NAFTA thing, well, that might be a bit of tweaking for Canada, despite all the blustering from the president. Do you, do you really think that Trump, that President Trump would go that far with China? Well, if he wants to finance his corporate tax cuts, the, the Republicans already have a policy, uh, and the key part of that policy is the corporate tax cuts but it's also the border adjustment tax. Uh, and so that is one option that he would be considering. Right. If that's too hard, then you just put tariffs on. Okay, well, let me, there was a, another question from the floor a minute ago, and I might throw it again, but back to uh, Christine and, and uh, Ben, because um, tax changes from the Chinese government is what is um, concerning a lot of exporters. Now, how do you move on from this 
what, once you've got um, you know, some sort of tax regulatory hurdle, regulatory hurdle in China, how do you continue with your strategy, Christine? Well, I think it's the same in any market, quite honestly. Sometimes when you have a setback, it's actually good for business because it makes you focus, it makes you stop and think, is this really what we want to do? And every time it's happened to us with China, or Asia, which is not just China, we've always said, yes, this is what we want to do. And you need to go and engage with government, both here and in China. On and the know, ground? On the ground. And, you, and government relations in China is incredibly important. It's actually something Maggie and Jack Ma do very well. Um, so I think it's very important. Look, you know, in every business, something happens you didn't, you didn't expect. You then have to stop and think, okay, do I really want to do this? And you have to work hard to find different routes in. It doesn't stop you. If it does stop you, you probably shouldn't have been doing it in the first place. Right. So, David, what can the government do to help businesses in this space? And indeed, does the, does the free trade agreement with China matter? Sure, absolutely it does. Um, I, I think what we're talking about here are really the, the non-tariff barriers or the behind the border uh, issues that come up. Um, these are very much uh, catered to within the China Australia Free Trade Agreement, and, and they're in fact um, these are features that you would find in any high quality agreement. That, <coughs> excuse me, the Japanese agreement we have with Japan, and the agreement that we have with Korea, and absolutely yeah, there's the mechanism. Three, 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 well, we, three, 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 we have many. Yes, <laughs> but the tree with three big ones with Asia. Uh, well, and then it's also an answer to which is an extremely high quality agreement between Australia and New Zealand and uh, the Asian economic community countries. Uh, so, uh, but, but specific to CHAFTA, because you asked the question, there is a specific mechanism built into CHAFTA to uh, uh, address uh, behind the border issues uh, as, they, uh, as they come up. Uh, what, what about the idea of trading in uh, the renminbi? Is that a good thing for businesses to be doing? Well, it certainly increases your, gives you greater, op, uh, more options. Um, so if you're able to settle uh, an RMB, uh, then that can, uh, you're taking risk out of the equation for the other party. Uh, it would give you uh, theoretically an opportunity to uh, price better. Uh, do you do that? Market. Yes, we do. You know, that's what the consumers are paying, paying in. You know, Alipay. It's actually bigger than cash in China now. And uh, I think it's really important you understand your consumers. If they want to pay in RMB, if they want to pay in Alipay, if they want to pay in Hong Kong dollars, all fine with me, just pay me. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, you see a, do you see a big market, a big, much bigger market of trading in the Chinese currency rather than our own from here? Well, we still have the issue of capital controls. We still have the the, the ongoing issue at the moment for China is that their foreign reserves have fallen from $4.2 trillion to $3 trillion. We don't know the level at which they will draw a line in the sand. Why do you want a lot of foreign reserves? We want a lot of foreign reserves if you want to retain control over the currency. Uh, and the theoretical models tell us that China could still lose another trillion and would still have adequate reserves to uh, give them the flexibility around their currency. But we just seem to get the impression that there's a, a nervousness uh, already emerging, particularly around the ability of um, uh, residents to invest offshore. So we, if we start to see that happening, it's going to become more difficult for, uh, say, banks to get access to R&D. And that's obviously something that um, makes that particular model more difficult. We had total total access to the RMB, total capital flows, and it makes a lot of sense. But to the extent that that becomes more difficult to access, uh, it's a, it, it, it makes it, it it's a it, it's not not constructive. Okay, Christina, yes, come in. Yeah, um, the, 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 also the, uh, I also want to cover the topics of the FDA. Yeah. Yeah, so because of the uh, today, the, the many government sector people in here, is that the uh, uh, some of you know the, the Japanese government also ratified the, the uh, TTP, uh, sorry, the TTP is that the uh, but not the reason is that the from the telecommunication operator is that the, the TPP or pre-FTA not only to the to the 
import tax or they get the new uh, is export tax or they did also cover the topics of the technology. Is it to unify the board and also encoding? Uh, and, uh, yeah, is it to do like a transmission of the data? Is that this one is a very key to expand the business. Is it to the uh, I don't mean to the like a Pokemon. Is it to the just import this one? But uh, but uh, uh, indirectly is related is because why do the Australia also they have a very good the uh, movie industry mm -hmm. and to the right the content delivery they have to be to the to define in the to the aspect the to the regular the framework. Uh, FDA and so on. Is a from the to the uh, business side of the person. Is a, I'm so much expect here to the Australian government and to the to the contribution. So, so your leadership to Abi and Donald Trump, they had a big bear hug, like <laughs> golf together. Your um, Now, now, do you think do you think the TPP can be? Uh, reignited without the United States, because of course they're pulled out. Ah uh, yes, I hope so. Is to the and to the this one is to the not to the to direct to the to the economic of the to benefit. Is that yeah? Of course, is to the to eventually yes, but the more to the encourage of the to technology and the more encourage of the to the like the business to the development here. All right. So for businesses out here, what can this wave of e-commerce? Perhaps one for David again. What can this wave of e-commerce offer, offer Sydney? Well, um, it already has offered a considerable amount. So uh, let, let's take those gains home. Um, the, but we are underpenetrated. Uh, there's a lot more that Australian business can do to engage with uh, what is uh, we've never seen this before. <clears throat> we've never seen a market where there are 800 million people. Uh, who are connected to the internet uh, via a uh, converged device. Um, now that creates a whole host of opportunities. <clears throat> People in China, a, a question was asked earlier about you know, user requirements, uh, how do you engage 29 years old, time 29 year olds and so forth. First start with the understanding that they, these are the most enmeshed people in the world vis-a-vis -vis, um, the digital world. Um, and then if you're going to engage with them, you're, you're, you've got to engage with them in the digital world. Um, that's, a, that's a very fundamental understanding that, that you have to have. Um, so that calls forward uh, uh, opportunities for Sydney businesses around uh, fintech in particular. Um, I always say, you know, look, at, uh, look at our banking system here, or our financial services system here, or CBA by one example. CBA's technology project was the single largest banking technology project in the world. Now consider the ecosystem that had to exist in order to enable that to happen, right? So what that's a tremendous capability set. Now apply that to the China digital context. Move beyond e-commerce um, uh, environment. Um, a top policy priority for the Chinese government. Soil, water, air. Um, and I guess, I guess Health. I've just uh, rung up one of my friends who's 100 today, mm -hmm. but I reckon there's a lot more 100-year-olds in Japan and in China and the whole idea of e-health and health services generally. Demographic winter is a big trend everywhere, no less so than in China, uh, but uh, I think one of the most interesting opportunities in China is the 16,000 hospitals that China is privatizing. Now, healthcare is one of the big win areas in the China Free Trade Agreement. Most Australian companies can own 100% of the equity uh, in uh, hospitals and age healthcare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see, uh, when, you, when you go and talk to people in China, are they looking, obviously your, your uh, company is very much the clean green option and you're trading very much on that. Do you see companies asking you about other services as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, we have one partner in China and they have a hundred thousand pharmacies. Can you imagine that? In Australia we have five thousand pharmacies and one of the big things that they want to support and it's about education and knowledge of Western vitamins for their people. Can I pick up on the question you asked a moment ago about how can you how can Australian businesses benefit from the digital economy when we look to Asia? I, I'm almost hating myself to keep using China as an example, but it's a really great one. You know, for many Australian businesses, they think about the cost of entering another market. It's quite prohibitive. You know, you're a small business, you think about cash flow. 
And then you look at and say, how am I going to take on China? Well, you know, things like the digital economy enable you to do it and access customers much lower costs. And sometimes what's important is to find the relevance for your products for those markets. Here in Australia, we already have one million WeChat accounts alive here. So actually, Australian businesses can test their products and services, first of all on WeChat, and find out if their products and services are massive, massive. Yes, absolutely. And social media force, isn't it? And if anybody really knows the value of tourism, it's not just the tourist who comes, it's actually this whole ripple impact of the people around them that they then spread the message and the whole family and friend influence. So WeChat is a great way for small businesses in Australia to really test whether their products have an opportunity. And then social media and e-commerce platforms are low, way, are low cost ways for them to enter that market. Later on, they have to spend money. You know, my recommendation is they spend money. They build the brand, they put people on the ground, and they invest in the country. But to get into that market, I think it's not good. Yeah, Bill, uh, banking, fintech, financial services, and engagement with Asia. Of course, uh, one of your competitors has engaged hugely in Asia and then had to withdraw a lot. I mean, what, what are the risks here? I mean, it must be quite large. Yeah, Tiki, I think one of the um, well-worn but not often absorbed laws of banking is that it's not really, retail banking is not a great export industry. We haven't seen too many examples around the world of companies that have successfully exported retail banking now. I guess well, you could say... Well, I'm looking at HSBC just this week as well. HSBC just this week is That's not That's right, good. HSBC, <laughs> Citibank has uh, scaled right back. It's very much a, um, in terms of retail banking, understanding the credit risks in your own bank, in, in, in the domestic economy. Uh, I think in terms of China, I think foreign banks have about 2% of the market. Another example of how difficult it is for the foreign banks to get access to the RMB for deposits to be able to lend to their customers offshore. Uh, so I think that uh, the best way we can um, handle the banking is very much at the wholesale level capital markets, financial markets, those types of activities. And certainly that's the uh, approach that West Bank takes. How big do you think the tourism industry could be for Asian <coughs> trade? Well, the, the number that always sticks in my mind is that, um, is that uh, I think it's 5% of Chinese who have passports. So it's, uh, it's just an extraordinary number. And that, that's gonna be Australia's capacity to deal with that. But as I said, there is that concern that if China was to be uh, challenged with threats on their goods exports, uh, they may decide that the leakage of their services imports, that is tourism education, might have to slow down. Because how, clearly, how, and how, how much of the Chinese market, isn't it a growing amount though that actually uh, it is really driven by its own consumers? rather than internationally. Is that a growing proportion and how does that impact? Yes, well, up until a year or so ago, the, the, the plan was to rebalance the Chinese economy away from heavy industry and exports and construction and manufacturing towards services. Uh, and for a couple of years there, services sector was growing by about 10% and those sectors weren't growing at all. Oh. Uh, but that slowed the economy too much. And in this year, which is very important for the um, authorities in China because it's a national congress at the end of the year, um, the policy turned around completely. So now we're seeing substantial growth in infrastructure uh, investment, a re-booming housing market. And these factors, have, um, I think, are going to create imbalances that China will have to deal with later on. Because the people that look at China say, well, why is it that corporate debt in China is 170% of GDP? Whereas in other countries it's less than 100%. And the reason is the state owned enterprises have excessive debt, excessive excess capacity, and at some point they'll have to deal with that problem. We've spoken a lot about China today. What, what about the other opportunities in ASEAN uh, countries? Uh, it's an ASEAN anniversary, isn't it, this year, David? Uh, yeah, we're coming up in, uh, actually, uh, on the other side of 218. Um, the uh, about uh, two years ago, 18 months ago, um, we began to see that uh, ASEAN had changed, but Australia's perceptions of ASEAN had not. Um, and 
we saw some very important drivers um, that signaled this trend that change. The first of those was the implementation of the ASEAN Economic Community and very importantly, the elimination of all tariffs uh, amongst ASEAN countries. Um, the uh, very marked uh, shift uh, towards services, um, which immediately alerted us to the opportunity of we are 80% of GDP services. Here are countries that are well below that watermark, but looking to increase services of percent of GDP. There's a role for us to play in that. Um, the rise of regional corporate champions, which were essentially the glue that was starting to take what had previously been viewed as a collection of subscale fragmented markets into not one wholesome market, but an increasingly uh, connected market. ASEAN uh, is the single, collectively, is the single largest recipient of foreign direct investment in the world, greater than that of China, five times that of India. Uh, and then, of course, the education and skills uh, gap and the opportunity to fill that gap. So we felt that by weaving these uh, major drivers together, synthesizing it into a narrative, we were able to take Australian business from disorientation about ASEAN to orientation about ASEAN, to sort of plant that firmly uh, in the strategic planning mindsets of Australian uh, business uh, around and, and what about what the Australian government is doing for for business in the region? Um, you've sure. got you've got yeah. quite an investment in Singapore, don't you? Uh, look, blocking blocking tactic again. We are the we're behind the borders team. Uh, uh, we're a client services organization. Most of our people are on a business who speak the language. Um, we will work with you uh, to build your businesses. Uh, the door is open. We've got great agreements in Asia as well as in China, the door is open. Uh, we will help you walk, walk through that door. Uh, but uh, ASEAN uh, is uh, not, this is what Chuck, it's an execution challenge, right? So we'll work, work with you, but you know, it's, it's, it's not made, necessarily meant to be easy. Uh, it's an execution challenge. Tsuyoshi, can I ask you about Japan? Because for, for businesses in Australia trying to access the Japanese consumer, how easy is that? What should they look for? Yeah, to, the, uh, Japan to, the consumer to, yeah, to access the Japanese consumer, maybe from Australian businesses, Australian products. Oh, yes, it is, uh, to the, uh, uh, of course, it is, uh, now that it is to the, uh, the, some of the tourists of the, 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 from Japan, and to the, to the historically to the high, and to now it is focusing to the, the last year, it is to the already going away, and to the, 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 and the partners also they expanded to like Haneda. And also the very similar situation with the telecommunication, either to reaching either to the uh, to Haneda to the uh, US or the uh, yeah. right like a more to the to the uh, as a tourist and to the uh, and uh, presumably they still eat a lot of wagyu beef up there. Yeah. 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 Uh, so agriculture. Uh, yes, agriculture is uh, to the one of the and uh, quite unique is uh, to the uh, way to the uh, Australia has a very uh, strong advantage in the to the export and the uh, import to the now in the to the Japanese udon or ramen is uh, to most of the to the air uh, to the now is uh, to close to the sixty percent uh, from the Australia to the, to the Japan. The this one is uh, to the now they are quite common. Uh, to, so the uh, I, I believe they are not to the. To the Okay. Tiki, okay. I, I just, just to finish off, uh, look, um, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, uh, these are all markets that have substantial scale. Uh, these are all markets that are growing 5% plus per annum. Yes. These are all markets where the drivers, the, the, these are consumption driven markets, and the drivers behind these markets are sustainable. I can can we detect things. products though? Like, you know, suddenly we know, we know that the Chinese markets, they love their pills, don't they? They love their pills. Um, they also love dry baby milk powder. Um, do we know what the Indonesian market really needs or loves or what the, you know, have we got a handle? I mean, I know that's terribly crude to say that. Don't you. <laughs> we employ 800 people in Asia. 700 of those are in ASEAN. In fact, we're just starting with a partner in Indonesia. We will have over 200 people employed by the end of June. Indonesia, as David said, is a really important market. You know, there are 300 million people living in Indonesia. And it's closer. It's closer. It's a democratic society. 
is just above us. It's probably closer than Perth for a lot of us. And you know, here it is with one of the biggest, fastest growing middle class there is. You know, it's going to be the world's fourth biggest economy very soon. And yet, as a country, we're still investing more in New Zealand than we are in Indonesia. Now, I like New Zealand, however. But, but there must be some, there's quite a difference between Indonesia and New Zealand in terms of ease of doing business, risks, all that sort of stuff. Yes, you, yes, you know, I think you raise a very good point because New Zealand is number one in the world for ease of doing business and Australia is number 14. So maybe we need to think um, about what we need to do and they're doing. But you've got to think about the opportunity. Why in Australia would we want to be part of, between Australia and New Zealand together, 2% of global growth and trade, when we've got this fabulous opportunity right on our doorstep. And they like us. So, you know, we don't have the problems of the US and China looking at what they think of each other. Everybody likes the Aussies. And you think clean and green, obviously, is such an important driver. Uh, in terms of our, our products. How important do you think made in Australia for the content is? Because the branding in China, I think, is so crucial. And if anybody just nips at that branding and says, hmm, maybe that's not quite what we thought it was, the risk that you will lose your customers is huge. How do Australian businesses manage that? I think you, you know, if you take one of our products, you know, our ingredients, 98% of them come from all over the world. Yeah. You know, our fish oil comes from South America. We get our fish processed in, um, in Norway, actually. So we believe that you get the best quality ingredients all over the world. We manufacture here, we bottle here, and then we ship out to the market. And that you have built your brand on that basis. We have, but what I would also say, it's very important for me, for Australia, however, don't underestimate the power of other countries and their ability to actually take this away from Australia. You look at the UK at the moment, you know their, their exchange rate is down 35% since the announcement of Brexit. Many people in China think the UK is quite a good brand, thank you. Canada, Germany, they're all they're all very strong. Do you build your view then on the risk front? I mean, look what happened with the dairy market. One of the reasons that, in fact, New Zealand and Fonterra fell over was because suddenly we had dairy markets being supplied in Europe from all sides. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that the Asian region, there tends to be two types of economies there. One type that uh, is very reliant upon commodity exports, particularly to China. Another type that's very reliant upon manufactured goods exports to the US. Uh, if we were to see a, and what and the, the ultimate goal would be to get those growth that growth coming from domestic consumption mm. and the lift in the standard of living and that being the, the, the driving force behind their growth. We're not there yet. In the short term there are these risks, particularly around US trade policy that could affect these exporters, mm. particularly around the impact that, that could have on China and the commodity cycle. Uh, and also, if the US dollar goes on a tear again, if Trump is successful with his policies, and the US dollar goes on a tear, these countries are going to have real problems attracting capital. They'll have to raise their interest rates, and that won't be constructive either. Right. So longer term, I absolutely agree with you that the Asian, the ASEAN goal is to get the growth coming from domestic consumption, lifting standard of living at, at, as well. But in the, in the shorter term, these risks are very real that we're facing over All the right, just, years. just attached to that, another question from the audience. Who are our biggest competitors, David, uh, in Asia competing for that? Or, sorry, who are the biggest competitors around the world competing against us for business in Asia? Uh, look, that's a, that's a great question. A um, couple of layers. Layer number one is, I spoke earlier about the regionalization businesses across uh, Asia, um, and of course uh, that would include uh, Chinese businesses, Chinese businesses, so Asians competing in Asia, layer number one. Um, the opportunity is not lost on them, but think about um, global growth. Where in Europe is growth? Uh, the U.S. is growing at you know, 2%, whatever. So countries, are, a company in Latin America as well. So uh, around the world, um, everybody is hungry for growth. Where do you find growth? find growth in Asia. So it's, it's natural to expect that uh, 
Asia, uh, is, a Asia and Asia in particular, is an absolute magnet for competition. And of course, that's something that you, you want to bear in mind is that um, you're not going to be the only swimmer in the pool. Uh, so uh, it is a, a hotly contested marketplace. Uh, but uh, when you look at the data, uh, the export outcomes of both you know, goods as well as services of Australian companies, we are making considerable progress. The double-digit growth rates, they're not made up, they're real. And do you think um, around Asia, Christine, names like um, Blackmores, Burmese, Treasury, Wine Estates, I mean, these are all fantastic names to, to get the word out across Asia. Do you think the word is traveling? Oh yes, of course I do. I think, um, you know, ASEAN is our second biggest trading partner. Many people don't realize that. But, uh, but you know, Australia has a fantastic reputation, not just for being clean and green, actually for quality. You know, and that's why financial services, that's why education, that's why health. And that is very important. So Australian brands, Treasury Wines, I think have done an outstanding job. You know, Bellamy's have had a bit of a tough time, but they're still their brand is highly regarded and respected, as were they do. You know, so I think we've got lots of diverse examples of Aussie companies really benefiting from the opportunity that Asia brings. And, and you thinking of having your deal in the, in the milk area now, thinking of all about the clean green and combining together, doing those sorts of deals um, across companies. I think, do, you, do you think we'll see more of that? I think we will see more collaboration and I hope we do because Australian companies should be coming together to help promote Australia. We compete against America in Asia, so forgive me, David. But, you know, it's a great opportunity for us right now, being Australian, we're neutral, you know, we're everybody's mate. So I think now is the right time for us to get up and go get that market. <laughs> oh, this is working. Um, to, to say that the Australian government uh, is Again, persistently out there creating the necessary preconditions for Australian business to be successful in numerous ways. Free trade agreements, uh, export market development grants, uh, open skies agreements with China, uh, you name it. Uh, and, and the behind the borders team that's ready and, and willing to help you. Uh, and what has been pleasing to see, uh, certainly in the last three to five years, from my perspective, is to see uh, leadership uh, and uh, entrepreneurial management teams like Christine and, and her team. Uh, that, and I'm not just giving Christine the deserve up, but if you have the poster child in their arms, we refer to her. So um, to, to see um, you know, Australian capability, um, once that door is open, to walk through that door. Uh, and uh, I think you know, we, we beat ourselves a, a lot here in Australia. I think that's well overdone. Just picking up on one other question from the audience, which is that, of course, China is very busy with its Silk Route development relationships with other countries in China. Is that likely to impact on our trade relations, perhaps UN bill trade relations with, with China? No, please. And other countries, actually. Oh, look, uh, my uh, um, biggest concern in terms of um, these issues is that if we do get an, an escalation of um, trade frictions between China and the US, Australia will be in a very awkward position. And so we don't we, want to we see can't that sit happen. On the fence. Absolutely. So we don't we really don't want to see that happen. China will always want our iron ore. They'll always want our coal, but they might not want our services. So that is the is the issue that Let's hope it doesn't come to so, this. So, so then you would argue that we should be putting our eggs in many other the ASEAN baskets who don't have that. Problem. Yes, but if there, was, if there was that sort of trade friction, the rest of ASEAN would not escape the, um, the after effect of that, believe me. Yeah. But I mean, how can we crank up David's services, um, uh, services exports to, to other ASEAN countries? By doing exactly what we're doing, uh, it, uh, which is, um, uh, again, putting in place the necessary conditions, i.e. SEMA uh, is, is a good example of that. Minister has made it a priority to uh, close the free trade agreement with Indonesia, uh, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, 
Our, our Mr. Chobo is, um, is, he's, he's, he's well understood. Uh, he is absolutely committed, this government is absolutely committed to um, uh, seeking out and, and sanding down uh, any trade friction that they find anywhere in the world. We will trade with anybody. Uh, and this is one country that uh, is, is able to demonstrate um, and to be an exemplar uh, in the whole of the world why free trade works. And I think that's the message that the government's trying to get across. And I think that is the message that will prevail. Mm. Finally, tech startups going into Asia. How good are we at that? Um, how good are we at that? Uh, let well, me let me answer let me answer it this way. So if you're if you're uh, I ran a venture capital fund for ten years, so a little bit about this. If you're a uh, early stage tech company, um, you want every, every company is the same. You want a couple of things. Number one is um, you want money to grow. Uh, number two is <clears throat> you want customers. Right. Three is you want to uh, build a talented uh, management team in. And the fourth is you want to uh, link to proprietary networks that uh, help you to uh, further enhance your, your product, your technology, uh, and will give you access uh, to make yourself to make your company successful. All of these things uh, exist in spades in Asian markets. There's no reason to be my often and think that your opportunity set is just Australia. And I don't think there are very many. Um, startup companies in Australia who suffer from that illusion. So we're pretty busy, um, and Pip Dawson is here in the room today. Um, uh, Pip is the engineer behind our landing pass program, which is to create a bridge uh, to get uh, startups uh, from Australia uh, into uh, global markets, uh, Asian markets in particular. Um, but we're not the only ones. There are many other players out there who are uh, championing this cause. So I think the um, the, the, the trend is, uh, is is a positive trend. Um, I don't think it's, it's lost on people the, the relevance, the importance of Asia, particularly uh, an, an Asia that is um, so digitally connected as they are. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fascinating. Would, would you want to add one last point? No? I think I've got your message loud and clear. You're really worried about Donald Trump. Yes. <laughs> um, You've been in the US for three weeks. You can't help but come away with no, no, uh, no. those concerns. I get your message loud and clear. But look, I, I would uh, like a fascinating panel. I would, and I'm so glad the city actually broadened it out a little bit beyond Asia. And uh, very, very good, uh, Tsuyoshi Kawashima, to have you on the panel as well. Thank you to Christine Holgate. Thank you, Bill, Bill Evans. And thank you to David Landers. There is a networking lunch. Uh, very shortly, so please, some names will be mentioned by our panels in the audience. Do go up, speak to speak to our panel, and uh, enjoy the lunch. But thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs>